morning, men. So uh, this morning we'd like to uh, welcome to the live Bible study uh, 10 area directors in training. Uh, you, if, if you've been here, you know that Man in the Mirror is in the process of, of hiring 330 area directors, one for every 1,000 churches. And we have so far appointed about 70 area directors, a little over 70, and 10 of them are in training, their first training this week. And so uh, if you're uh, an area director, you just raise your hand wherever you are and just keep it up for a second. And uh, so would you join me in welcoming these men? Yep. Great. So uh, thanks, guys, for being here. Their mission is to build relationships with about roughly 100 uh, churches in the area over the first three years when they go active and consult with them to help them to be more effective in, in discipling men. So uh, let's go ahead and do a shout out this morning. We have uh, this group meeting in uh, Ware, Massachusetts. Uh, Bob Hamilton is leading this group of six to eight men. They meet at 7 a.m. on Saturday mornings, and they're doing the online videos with us. And so I wonder if you'd join me in giving them a man in the mirror, a great man in the mirror. Welcome. One, two, three, hoorah. Welcome, guys. Uh, glad to have you uh, with us. All right. So we're in this series, Hanging Out with Jesus. And uh, I uh, ran across this this week. I don't usually do these things, but somebody sent me this over the Internet. And, of course, you know it's true because it came over the Internet. And, uh, but apparently, UPS pilots and mechanics have a good time together. So a UPS pilot, when something goes wrong, he will fill out what they call a gripe sheet, turn it in, then the mechanics make the fix, and, and then the pilot looks at that before the next time he goes up to make sure everything was fixed. So these are reported to be some actual uh, exchanges. Pilot, test flight okay except auto land very rough. Mechanic, auto land not installed on this aircraft. <laughs> Pilot, something loose in cockpit. Mechanic, something tightened in cockpit. <laughs> Autopilot, pi this is the pilot. Autopilot in altitude hold mo mo mode, e easy for me to say, produces a 200 feet per minute descent. Mechanic, cannot reproduce problem on ground. <laughs> Pilot, evidence of leak on right main landing gear. Mechanic, evidence removed. <laughs> Pilot, IFF, whatever that is, inoperative in off mode. Mechanic, IFF always inoperative in off mode. <laughs> <laughs> Pilot, number three engine missing. <laughs> Mechanic, engine found on right wing after brief search. <laughs> uh. Well, it's, uh, it's good to have fun, and Christianity is, there's nothing more fun than Christianity. There's no, nothing that brings more joy, more happiness than Christianity, except when you have someone in your life that you love who does not believe in Jesus, and then everything changes. So... Men tend to compartmentalize. Women, seems like when they have a problem, that problem affects every area of their lives, spills over into all the compartments. But men, when we have a problem, we compartmentalize. But if you have someone that you love who doesn't know Jesus, then you know, like me, that you've become a woman. 
you become a woman because that now, that affects every area of your life. It just sort of, sort of knocks off the, uh, a li- I'm not going to say it takes away the joy of Christ, but it just, it, it, it puts a burden on your life. Just every place you turn, it just puts a burden on your life. And so uh, what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a, at a story that we know as the Palm Sunday story. The title of the message is that Jesus gets flash mobbed. And uh, what I want us to see uh, to begin with is this idea that there is a carefully choreographed mission underway. So let's talk first about the big picture. The big picture is that Jesus has a singular mission that he is on, and it is total global conquest. Jesus is interested in in bringing the gospel of salvation to every person. God our Father wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So God's mission is total global conquest. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. If you believe in me, you will have eternal life and you will never perish and no one will be able to snatch you out of my hand. So that's the mission. That's the big picture of the mission. And it goes even deeper than that because Jesus said the the thief referring to the devil, his purpose is to steal from you, to kill you, to destroy you and everything you love. And, and my purpose is that you might have a rich and satisfying life, an abundant life, that it might be full and it might be meaningful. And so what I'm going to do, Jesus says, is I'm going to come and I'm going to show you how to make that your reality and how you can help make that the reality of everybody you come in contact with, everybody you love, everybody you care about. And so he begins by saying in John 5, 39, he said, the scriptures are about me. Moses wrote about me. And in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 12, he says, and I am watching over my word to perform it. I am watching over my word to perform it. All of these things that we read, I am watching over this word that has been written down by the prophets to perform it, to make it become a reality. And so this morning we see a great example of exactly how Jesus makes that happen. Now, this particular uh, story is in all four Gospels. And so, uh, just just a note, so Matthew... Matthew was writing to the Jews. Matthew was trying to persuade the the Jews that Jesus was the fulfillment of the prophecies in the Old Testament, which, of course, that, that was their... That was their that was their New Testament, okay? That was their Bible, okay? And, and so, and so, uh, so Matthew, Jesus said the scriptures are about me. Matthew was going about the business of proving that. And so, in in the book of Matthew, there are approximately, according to one source, sixty fulfilled prophecies and forty Old Testament references. Mark, on the other hand was more, uh, Mark and, and uh, Luke in particular, and to some extent John, were written more to the Gentiles. And so Mark, rather than the fulfilling of prophecy, as in Matthew, Mark was more interested in presenting the great deeds, the great works of Jesus, uh, the miracles. And so, so there are, uh, in, in the book of Mark, there are 19 miracles that are reproduced. Luke, on the other hand, was more interested in, in presenting the biography of Jesus, the, the, the story of his life, and giving this accurate account of what happened in Jesus' life. And then we get to John, and John is, 
His purpose is to make it possible for us to have faith in the deity of Jesus. And so John emphasizes the deity of Jesus Christ. We need all of these different emphases in order to, to make a full gospel. And so, so all of the gospels repeat this story, but we're going to look at two to see the two unique perspectives of Matthew, who is talking about fulfilled prophecy. So we're going to start in this passage at Matthew chapter 21, verse 1. So as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, Bethphage, that's an easy word to say, right? Bethphage. Wow. You can go there today, by the way. And uh, as I recall, when I was there, they, somebody had set up a couple of donkeys or something tied to a rail as sort of a tourist attraction. As they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This, now watch this, follow this, follow this. This is important because this is why Matthew wrote his gospel to show the fulfillment of these prophecies about Jesus. So in verse 4, it says, This took place to what? To fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Zechariah, who said, Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. And so Jesus is orchestrating, choreographing this scene. Uh, Jesus, most of these fulfilled prophecies just happen, but Jesus is actually, he organized this as a publicity. He made this happen. He set this up. This wasn't going to happen unless Jesus uh, organized or choreographed this particular fulfillment of Scripture. And notice that Jesus, and, uh, and uh, of course Jesus was uh, there when the Scriptures were written. Jesus is the Spirit, right? Jesus is the Father. The Father is Jesus. The Father is the Spirit. Three in one. One in person. Three in a... So... So Jesus has already inspired the, uh, the, the, the Zechariah to write this prophecy, and now he orchestrates its fulfillment in actuality. And, and Jesus picked a donkey. Actually, the cult of a donkey. So kings used donkeys in the Old Testament, but also common people used donkeys. And as time went on, and by the time of Jesus in particular, donkeys were not looked upon with a, with a great uh, deal of, of pride. They were uh, sort of looked down on. And so Jesus did not pick a jewel-encrusted chariot to come into Jerusalem with, he picked a donkey, a sign of the common man, a sign of humility. He humbled himself and, and entered the city on a donkey, kind of like Pope Francis. You know, the whole Pope Francis, uh, his whole demeanor, his, his personal humility comes through over and over again. And that's that's what Jesus was, was doing. And then, and then, and then a flash mob. Watch this. Verse 6, the disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, 
while others cut branches. In another version, we know those are palm branches. Cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? Who is this? It was a flash mob. So just, just like you would see in a flash mob on a, on a video, somebody doing something very extraordinary and people wanting to know what's going on? What's going on? Who is this? And what do they say? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth in, in Galilee. And then just to take a look at this from Luke's perspective, turn, we'll look at the, 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 the end of the Luke passage. So turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 19, verse 37. Luke 19, 37. And it says, <clears throat> when he came uh, near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples. Now, before it was the crowd that was saying, this is the prophet from Nazareth. But now it says, the disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And so in Luke, we see that the emphasis is on the miracles. In fact, in the, in the John passage, it's specifically uh, the crowd is all amped up. They're, they're flashing because of the miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead. But Luke points out, well, yeah, it's that miracle, but it's also the accumulation of all the miracles. All of these things that have accumulated, all these things that have happened, all of these fulfilled prophecies that the people have been seeing, all of the miracles that, that have been recorded in Mark, these things are adding up. There's a cumulative effect for that. And the disciples, they break out in praise. And you know that this is exactly what happens in your life. When, when you are regularly in the Word of God, and he is speaking to your heart and you are out connecting with other people, uh, Christians, and they're sharing the reality of Christ in their life or non-Christians. And you see the light start to come on in them. You, you have this accumulation of praise. You, you, and the Bible says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Well, how do you get there? You get there by engaging. It's a, it's a carefully choreographed mission, and we're part of the mission. Okay, so here's the big guy. Here's the big news. Here's the big news. After all that time, after all that time, 2,000 years, it's the same mission. We're on the same mission. Nothing has changed. It is exactly the same the marching orders, go and make disciples, never amended, never rescinded, never altered. That's the mission. There is no other mission. So Jesus is investing in men and asking them to go and invest in other men. That's what he was doing then. That's what he's doing now. Then he had a donkey bring him to the people. Guess what? Now you're the donkey. You're the donkey. You're the one he wants to bring this great news to the people over whom he weeps. Let's read on. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd, verse 39, they said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He replied, I tell you, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it. He wept over it. Here's the big idea today. 
I am part of a carefully choreographed mission to bring Jesus to the people over whom he weeps. You think you're weeping over somebody that doesn't know Christ? Yeah, well, you are. Do you know why you're weeping? Because it is God who is weeping over that person. And by his spirit, he's put in you. He is sovereignly orchestrating all human events to bring that person into right relationship with him. And he's using you to do it. So he's, he's letting break your heart what breaks his heart. So we weep. It's not, it's not we that want that person. It's that it's Jesus that wants that person. And so I, this is uh, for you to say to yourself, I am part of a carefully choreographed mission to, to bring Jesus. I'm the donkey now. I'm bringing them. I'm not saying to people, oh, come. I, a church sign one day said, come and be discipled. I don't think so. It's go and make disciples. We're bringing Jesus to the people. That's what's going on here. Jesus is bringing himself to the people. He's not, he's not up in the temple saying, come on over here and I'll tell you how to be saved. He's going to the people. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants to bring Jesus to the people, the people he cares about, the people for whom Christ died. So why was Jesus weeping? After all, this is the height of his popularity. He's got this flash mob. But it's because who was in the crowd? It's because of who was in the crowd. Yes, there were disciples in the crowd. But there were also people in the crowd who, who were, uh, had confused expectations. This is a case of uh, confused expectations. Uh, in in John, John chapter 11 somewhere, right, right before this story in John, it says that the people were expecting a kingdom that was going to come immediately. They were looking for, they were looking for a jewel-encrusted chariot to bring their leader in. They weren't looking for a donkey. They were looking for... Uh, they were looking for temporal salvation. They were looking for relief from the oppression of, of the government. And so they thought, they thought that this moment, they thought they were laying down their garments. They were putting down these palm branches. Many of them were disciples, but many of them thought they were putting these things down for a military coup. So they were, they were, a, they were flash mobbing because they thought, a, a temporal leader. And you know how it is when, when, you, when your guy is running for office and you think he's winning, you know how excited you get? And when he wins, you know, when your guy wins the elected office, you, you want him to win. You're pulling for him. You're flash mobbing for him. because Why? Because you want him to solve your temporal problems. You want, you're looking for a savior. You're looking for somebody to, to take care of you, to take care of uh, uh, all of the cultural decay and all of the poverty and the racism and, and the fatherlessness and all of these things. When... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, a former mayor of Orlando, Bill Fredericks, uh, was uh, considering running for governor. And so the papers were filled with information about this. And so uh, in the days when I was a real estate developer, I'd had many uh, dealings with the city. And so we knew each other. I saw him at a uh, dinner one night, a UCF uh, dinner. And, uh, and so I went up and I said, I said, Bill, I, uh, I'm so excited you're thinking about running for governor. I just really like to encourage you to, to run for governor. I think that would be awesome. I said, you're the kind of man we need. Uh, you, you, you can change things. You can make a difference. He said this. He said, well, you know, I, uh, I would really appreciate if you pray for me about making the right decision. Oh, I realized, oh, I, oh, I didn't care at all about him. I didn't care about, uh, well, I just thought it would be cool 
to know somebody that was the governor of Florida. I didn't care about what God was saying to him, what God's calling was on his life. I was just, it was my man, you know? And so I flash mobbed him right there on the spot. So, you know, I, I said, oh, well, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And, and walk, you know, slinked away. The next morning, the next morning, I, I really repented. Uh, I, I could barely get to sleep. I was repenting so crazy hard. The next morning, I got up, and uh, God came to me. And so I put together a little scriptural guide for someone to decide whether or not they should run for governor. And so it's like five pages of scriptures and the questions like questions like, you know, how do you go about being true to yourself? Uh, have you made a sober assessment of your ability to be governor? Uh, and then you all have scriptures after. Uh, if you choose to seek the governorship, will you be making the best use of the gifts you've been, been given or vice versa? Uh, have you, are you letting your concern over failure play a big part in your thinking? Why would you want to run? Blah, blah. Anyway, so all these kinds of questions. Five pages of them. And, uh, and it was pretty obvious that God had given it to me. So I made an appointment with uh, Mayor, Mayor Frederick, and I went down and I, and I gave it to him. And you know what? A few days later, he decided not to run. Now, I'm not saying that that was why, but, but uh, I'm sure it had a part in it. And, and since then, I've given it to uh, four uh, politicians, uh, Bill Nelson, Bill McCollum, and, and Bill Gunner. And, uh, you know, two of them decided not to, to run and two of them did. But anyway, the point of it is, is that, is that the reason that, that, that I was interested in that a, a, at all is just because I, uh, I was part of the crowd. I was, not, I was not plugged into what God was doing at the beginning of that. I just flash mobbed him. And so Jesus is weeping because there are people in the crowd like me. That's why Jesus is weeping. And you've got friends, loved ones, co-workers, neighbors, right now, that are just like that too. And Jesus is weeping over them. Now, Jesus is joy. Nothing interrupts the joy of Jesus. But there is still a part of Jesus that is always weeping over the lost. Big idea today is this. I am part of a carefully choreographed mission to bring Jesus to the people over whom he weeps. Finally, why being good, a good example is not enough. Why being a good example is not enough. The gospel of Jesus is not a feeling. The gospel of Jesus is not an esoteric idea. The gospel of Jesus is truth. The gospel of Jesus is analytical. The gospel of Jesus has content to it. So there are prophecies that were made about Jesus that had been fulfilled. There were great miracles that Jesus performed. And these had been recorded and these had been written down. And so there, there is content to the gospel. And it's not enough just to be a good example out in the community with people saying, oh, Brian, he's such a good guy. Boy, he's really got it together. He's a Christian, you know. But they don't know the, the, the content. They don't know the truth of the gospel that makes Brian the way that he is. Or 
somebody says, look at me, look at me. You can be like me. You're not drawing attention at that point to the gospel, to Jesus, to the historical Jesus. Our faith is not in an idea. Our faith is in the historical person of Jesus, the man who was also God, fully God, fully man. That is the truth to which we should draw people. And so to be a good guy, the problem is to be a good guy, it risks nothing. Do you understand that if you're a good Christian guy, that risks nothing? Who cares? You are, there is, there is no gain unless you take a risk. The people that we love, if we just model or example our Christian faith to them, but we don't explain to them this historical truth about this historical person. It is the, it is the person of Jesus. It is this simple narrative of Jesus, the, the birth, the, the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus. This is what draws people to him. I, I have taped a couple of things taped in my Bible. They've been taped there uh, almost forever, and, and they're by Oswald Chambers, and I want to read a couple of excerpts from them. If my holiness is not drawing towards him, it is not holiness of the right order. A beautiful saint may be a hindrance if he does not present Jesus Christ, but only what Christ has done for him. He will leave the impression, what a fine character that man is. And then from November 9th, it is not the strength of one man's personality being superimposed on another, but the real presence of Christ coming through the elements of the worker's life. When we preach or share the historic facts of the life and the death of our Lord, as they are conveyed in the New Testament, as I have been doing with you this morning, our words are made sacramental and God uses them to create in those who listen that which cannot be created otherwise. It's just the way it is. What a wonderful personality. What a fascinating man. Such marvelous insight. What chance has the gospel of God through all that? If a man attracts by his personality, his appeal is along that line. If he is identified, however, with the Lord's personality, then the appeal is along the line of what Jesus Christ can do. The danger is to glory in men. Jesus says we are to lift him up. Him up. That's the mission. Same mission, always been. Big idea today. You know, I am part of a carefully choreographed mission to bring Jesus to the people over whom he weeps. Would you say that with me? Say, let's say that together. I am part of a carefully orchestrated mission to bring Jesus to the people over whom he weeps. I did change the word. <laughs> That's called a mistake. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Our dearest Father, Lord, uh, we come to you today. We, we know, we, we all know everything that's been said today. We know. We either know it's true now or we already knew it's true and it confirms it. And Lord, <laughs> it's not enough just to be an example. We need to bring the, the facts of the truth of the historical person of Jesus to the people over whom you are weeping, over whom we are weeping, if we want to ever see anything change. And so, Lord, we thank you for this story to see how Jesus so carefully choreographed this publicity about the fulfillment 
of the prophecy, uh, how the people mobbed him, but yet he still wept. And Lord, uh, help us each to take away from these truths uh, something that will help us today uh, uh, to be more effective as we try to bring Jesus, as we become the donkeys and bring Jesus to the people over whom we are weeping as well as over whom you, Jesus, are weeping. We pray this in your name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.